Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. It's a Ukraine war news update, first part thereof, for the 29th of March, 2024. Let's get straight to where we normally start, Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before, all the usual caveats apply, of course, you can find them in the description to the video below. 820 personnel loss for the Russians, of course all these are human beings, please remember that. But they are also people who have, for one reason or another, invaded a sovereign, uh, self-determining, independent country. Uh, eight tanks, 27 armoured personnel vehicles. So eight tanks is about what we've seen for the last two or three days, really. It's still, you're not going to like losing eight tanks, but it's not the highest number we've seen in that category. 27 APVs and 28 artillery systems are significant numbers to add to the uh, to the daily totals that that, uh, that we've seen. Two multiple launch rocket systems and six anti-aircraft warfare systems. That is an absolutely staggering statistic in that category. Just huge. And then uh, 50 vehicles with fuel tanks and seven pieces of special equipment. So just, you know, consistently challenging numbers for the... Uh, Ukraine uh, for the Russians there we're going to go to Andrew Perpetua's loss statistics daily loss stats we didn't see yesterday's loss stats because they came out after I did my video uh, so we'll start with yesterday's and you can see it's approaching parity there uh, that's not what the Ukrainians will want at all they need at least a three to one loss ratio uh, what do we have for the Ukrainian losses a couple of um, unknown whether which side they're on at the bottom so you can take that into account but we have a number of boats a uh, piece of artillery, unmanned ground vehicle, wouldn't necessarily add that to the list. Um, uh, a few tanks, some quite a few M113s there, uh, which are the older APCs provided by a number of different countries, uh, the US, but also a number of European countries. Um, uh, what else do we have? Some trucks, four wheelers, pickups. Nothing hugely valuable in and of itself, but a large. Uh, array of Ukrainian vehicles there and boats included so that's that's going to hurt the Ukrainians in terms of mass when we look at the Russian equipment losses you've got some comms equipment another Brem 1 they've lost a number of recovery vehicles the Russians and I think that will be slightly challenging for their ability to uh, recover obviously uh, damaged pieces of kit on the front lines or near the front lines we have a TOS 1A a thermobaric launcher that has been taken out that'll be a sore loss for them uh, and then we have a number of tanks, including a T-90M, their uh, most modern best tank, basically. Infantry fighting vehicles, uh, a range of those, quite a lot of them. Uh, BMP-2s, 3s, BRMs, uh, BTRs, and lots of other letters thrown in as well. Uh, a number of APCs, trucks, um, civilian vehicles like Bukankas, the Scooby-Doo vans. Uh, it's a golf cart there and, and a quad. So all sorts of different things. I think the Russians ha will be smarting more than the Ukrainians there. Uh, but as I say, they need better ratios of Ukrainians. Uh, if it's just a one-to-one -one or even two-to-one loss ratio, the Russians can withstand those losses. Like uh, Double the losses, they can take that and and uh, it's not a problem for them going forward. They, they, will, they will be able to prevail. So what Ukraine need is a day like today. So the, the, that was yesterday's stats that we missed out on. The, these are today's stats. So take off the decoy at the bottom and you've got, I don't know, six to one loss ratio, maybe seven. So this is a day that, that puts yesterday's almost parity into better light. It sort of add these together and, and Ukraine are doing a better job overall. Um, let's look at the Ukrainian losses first. So... We have a nothing significant actually, a couple of tanks, BMPs, howitzer, uh, no really high value bit of kit there. For the Russians, we have a Su-27 that was lost. That was one that they they lost in uh, f to friendly fire in the Crimea area. We have an Osa Estrella, so two air defense systems. Although six were listed on yesterday's figures, there's often a delay that comes through uh, a lag. So I wonder whether we'll see uh, a number tomorrow on this list. A uh, radar system, um, a 9S36M fire control radar, that's part of either a book M1, book M2. That is a significant loss. It's going to hurt them. And another recovery vehicle, a two two forty millimeter self-propelled howitzer, a uh, number of pieces of artillery, a bunch of tanks of differing variants. 
and then the usual infantry fighting vehicles not as heavy losses as we have seen but still going to hurt some uh, apcs trucks civilian vehicles and then a number of golf carts and again quad bikes and buggies and all sorts so uh, you're seeing a number of these vehicles every day now in the russian loss stats which shows that they are using them and they're much more prevalent near the front line and again the same question are they using them because they have no choice or are they using them because they're the right thing to do i don't know that charging into ukrainian lines which we have seen on golf carts effectively and quad bikes is is the most effective way of keeping your soldiers safe um and attacking you know enemy positions so correct me if i'm wrong but i am erring to the side uh, of or this being kind of a desperation rather than a benefit to use these use these vehicles um, but yes yeah, so i think that's a definitely a good day for the ukrainians right uh, this is the su initially thought to be su-35 but uh, eventually which was like 100 million dollar airframe actually it's a su-27 which is i can't remember how much 30, 30 million or something so still gonna hurt a lot i mean if we go back to the lost stats that one plane just wipes out everything else you know for the last two days of the of the ukrainian losses so that's worth bearing in mind if we're just talking about value but of course it's not monetary value whenever you're talking about losses it's functional value so if if that is gone and these air defense systems are gone what what does that mean in terms of the russian ability to do the jobs that those pieces of kit do and you're losing often not in the case of the plane because actually it parachuted out and i presume survived but not necessarily but with a number of these bits of kit you are losing the personnel who have the expertise in using them so with all those artillery pieces being lost how many crew members for the artillery are lost when they lose the piece and what does that mean in terms of their ability to do the job of those planes or artillery and so on and so forth um anyway this uh su uh, there's a parachute coming out i i reported this yesterday in my frontline update actually it just come out then uh, this is quite spectacular imagery of this plane falling out the skies uh it was on the back end of uh, some air defense alerts air raid alerts in sevastopol right where that was taken out so the russians announcing that there, there's an air raid alert and then shooting down a plane which was their own or uh, their own plane falling from the sky uh, they are now pretty much admitting it was a friendly fire incident uh, and it was indeed this su-27 so uh, is that very unlikely the ukraines will be able to get their air defense rockets or missiles sorry all the way over Crimea and to hit a plane flying above Sevastopol so it is almost certainly going to be uh, an air uh, a friendly fire incident right we saw um or we have seen a number of times recently the use of the French AASM hammer uh, that is the guided glide bomb that they are providing 50 of a month uh, to the tune of 600 and I think they put a contract in for more of these to be uh manufactured nonetheless although that sounds great and it is great and they are having an effect 50 a month compared to the russians use of their own carb glided guide bombs where they use 700 in a week last week so again so as good as this is we must understand the concept context of the russians just having an absolute ton of these things anyway this was a building that was targeted and i just i can't really play it to you i'll get in trouble for doing so but i'll just give you the imagery of it there this was a really significant bang i think it was a drone a base drone hq and then at the end of it this is what's left i mean it's just wow it looks like matchsticks from from above now that has been violently violently disassembled by that hammer uh, guided glide bomb and if they can use these and they are using them more and more we are seeing evidence and it's being used i showed you some more footage from yesterday uh, in a similar area this is around kherson if, if the ukrainians can use these uh, really effectively then it could help to well, it's not going to, I don't know whether it turn momentum or the direction of the war or anything, but this is exactly what the Ukrainians need. They also need more planes that can uh, drop these 
Uh, so the thing with the Russians is they have a fairly sizable air force and they are flying consistently loads of sorties and dropping their car bombs and whatnot. The Ukrainians will have relatively small numbers of, of airframes that can drop these as well as a small number of ordnance as well. And the comparisons are in terms of scale, are, are, you know, they're light years apart. Right. Uh, destruction of Russian radar that we've already talked about. Someone says book three, uh, M3, others say M2, others say M1. So actually, who knows what uh, what book system it was, but the radar system was taken out, so that's useful. Uh, and taken out by an FPV drone. Um, good stuff there. Destruction of the uh, Russian 9K-33 OSA air defense in Kurdy-Mivka area. That's to the south of Bakhmut. And that is with another first-person view drone. Uh, doing its job. Drones really are um, just so important for both sides. Uh, reports of them just flying everywhere at the moment. Uh, in certain places on the front line, it must be just there must be such a psychological toll on soldiers that you just wouldn't want to leave your your dugout really. And even your, in your dugout, you're not safe. They're driving. They're flying these things through the entrance to dugouts and. Yeah, you. Be, I would just be looking in the air the whole time, worrying consistently about my own safety. Just anyway, here's another drone att attacking the Skakowitz Russian archer. The the two S forty flocks uh, entered service in October 2023. The claim here is its short range of about 10 kilometers makes it very vulnerable. For a um for a self propelled howitzer, 10 kilometers is absolutely useless. Well, it's not useless, but you are going to be super vulnerable. I don't know what the uh, the actual range of this is. I probably should look it up rather than just going on what this guy says. But here, here we have one of these getting taken out, which would be good. This is this is some footage spliced with the uh, drone footage. So I don't. That's not the one that gets hit. This looks like kind of one of those PR videos. They spliced in to show you what this would look like. Uh, as it's being set up. But anyway, uh, one of those getting taken out will, will be good news for the Ukrainians in terms of the PR victory of having one of the latest Russian bits of kit destroyed. Anyway, moving on to distance munitions. We got a we had a very busy night last night and the details aren't really forthcoming at the moment as to how much damage or exactly what damage was done predominantly to the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. But there was a big old wave of um, missiles and drones again last night. I should probably look at the what well, I don't know if Dell has put the date has put the data on the spreadsheet. Remember this spreadsheet is available every day. It's on my losses videos. He has uh, put together cruise missiles. So here's a cruise missile statistics. Uh, it should be turning up when it when it renders. So let's just do a bit of comparison here. This is the data for drones. We can see that, and I don't we I don't know if it's got last night's one on there. Nonetheless, we, we can see that there are oops, um yes, so drones are being fairly consistently used. We had recently a very high number, 75. It's not the 93 that we have seen back in November last year. And my claim is that they are struggling somewhat with the amount of, of drones and missiles they have. We'll look at the uh, missile data and then go on to adding them both together in the aerial attacks. Uh, something's uh, really struggling today. So here we have the uh, cruise missiles and we've had a couple of uh, a days, a number of days of fairly high numbers being used but I say fairly high when you compare that to 88 back in January early January and then going over back over to December 2022 uh, so when they were attacking the uh, the energy infrastructure not this last winter but the winter before you can see that the, there was consistent use of cruise missiles of a much higher number uh, than the missiles here. Now, I'd have to speak to Dell about whether the, these cruise missiles include actually uh, ballistic missiles, uh, because that's what they appear to be trying to use more of at the moment, uh, so that they can get through those air defense uh, networks and, and, and whatnot. So when we look at, I mean, there's a lot of data here, uh, but you can see kind of trends. This is adding drones and missiles together 
we're starting to see some pretty this is that 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 one recently that was particularly heavy attack uh, we had 150 missiles and that's probably therefore not including ballistic missiles but i need to look into that um so yeah it looks like they are i, I don't know whether they're just consistently making the missiles and drones at, at at the same rate that they were but what they were able to do previously is use up stocks but actually i you know i think they're just throwing them into ukraine at the rate they're they're producing them now the in the what's worth noting about this data is this data does not start at the beginning of the war as in it's not accurate so they didn't start compiling this data i i think until a long way through the war so this there there are there are beliefs that they actually fired far more than the record numbers in the early parts of the war, but people weren't counting them. So the, the opening months, they were absolutely hammering uh, Ukraine with the suppression of enemy air defence strikes they're also doing, and that these numbers would have been right up here. But but as mentioned, they just weren't they just weren't counting the missiles in the same way. Um, so yeah, for, you're going to have to forget. I think this whole period there. N nonetheless, uh, you can see that they are starting to you know have a couple of days of really trying to uh, destroy the ukrainian um energy infrastructure it seems at the moment they're, they're concentrating on that as a way of trying to disrupt the industrial capacity of the defense sector so what we saw um was ukraine shooting down 26 or 39 missiles and 58 or 60 drones so really good interception rate of drones almost 100 percent out of 60 is phenomenally good of the cruise missiles and Ukraine battle maps split these up into cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. You can see that 17 out of 21, 80, 81 percent of the so KH 101 cruise missiles or X 101, uh, five out of nine KH 59, four out of four is kind of K missiles. So that's really good. But then zero out of three Kinjals. So three daggers got through. Uh, zero out of two is kind of M. Uh, so the five ballistic missiles got through what damage did they do and as at ukraine battle map here says the reason i divide it up into different sections is because you know wanted to differentiate between cruise missiles that can be taken out by book nazam's iris t and the ballistic missiles which you know the inception rates were over 80 percent for those but the ballistic missiles you know, it can only be intercepted by patri Patriots, of which Ukraine only has three batteries. This is the reason why 0% of those were shot down. Uh, to stop those missiles, Ukraine will need more Patriot air defense systems because cu currently most of the country is defenseless against ballistic missiles. Um, luckily, they're good at shoot. Ukraine is good at shooting down Shahid drones, yeah, and th they seem to be getting better at that. Now, this is why. Uh, Zelensky was talking he had a brilliant interview on CBS that I might do separately there's no transcript for it yet but I want to just go through what he said because I think there's so much to pick out from it I'll try and do that as an extra but uh, he's massively on about patriots and air defense systems of course he is this is what Ukraine needs without this you will get slow these Patriots, you will get slow degradation of Ukraine as Russia realizes now more so than so. If you're talking about two years ago or the two winters ago, Russia were concentrating on hitting Ukraine's um, energy infrastructure, but they were doing that predominantly with cruise missiles. They weren't using their very best or their ballistic missiles because they were still working out what was effective and what wasn't. And I think we got to a point in the war where Russia knows exactly where all the air defense systems now are. And they know what missiles they can use against what, what targets. And you're just starting to see them eke out this advantage in terms of being able to degrade the, the Ukrainians in, in really significantly in terms of, say, energy by using particular missiles in particular places. Anton Gerashchenko then, you know, talks about this uh, as well. Uh, Russia's massive attack resulted in damage to the energy infrastructure in Dnipro, Petros, Venetia, Ivana, Frankivsk, uh, Lviv, Cherkasy, and uh, Chernivtsi uh, regions. So, right across the breadth of uh, Ukraine, there's been an awful lot of damage done last night, and I guess we'll we'll find out exactly how much as time progresses. Jay and Kiev says, well, Russia's $120 million missile drone barrage on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure last night. So, trying to point out that this is insanely costly for the for the Russians but of course 
the, the concern for the Russians is, are they getting a return on their investment? And if Ukraine's energy infrastructure is being crippled, then yes, for them, that's worth that kind of expenditure in, in missiles. The approximate route of the missiles last night and drones, uh, we can see that uh, actually relatively few um, routes being mapped out here. Previously, we've seen you know, all sorts of uh, color, colored routes on on the map relatively few there i don't know if they just don't know of the routes of some of the other missiles however you can see these ballistic missiles you know traveling over huge amounts of ukraine probably because they're very high in the atmosphere uh, so it's very difficult to shoot them down until they come down in their terminal phase but of course unless you have a patriot system around that area then what are you going to do? And it's interesting that this isn't even Lviv that's targeted a particular place in the West. So my bet is that, well, it, it could be an energy uh, energy plant. It's highly likely that they know of a military industrial facility there and they've hit it with uh, ballistic missiles. But again, uh, these are hitting Dnipro um, and areas in the middle here, not too far from Poltava. Uh, yeah, you, you can bet that they they are very specific in in their in their targets. There, these aren't just going to be slamming into apartment buildings with those ballistic missiles. Destruction says Anne Applebaum of Ukraine's energy infrastructure was previously impossible because Ukraine had enough ammunition for its air defense systems. Now, thanks to Speaker Johnson, so having to go at Mike Johnson and Trump, cities will go dark while the U.S. Congress is on vacation. So we know that the U.S. Congress is on two week. Uh, Easter recess, uh, meme, and the the Ukraine bill still hasn't been put to the floor, and as a result, people are dying, and energy infrastructure is being hammered, and sixty four billion dollars worth of of kit is still um, just a piece of paper. The West says Pekka Kalinyemi, having a rant about this as well, refuses to send air defences to Ukraine so that they could defend their energy infrastructure. And the US tried to, tries to forbid Ukraine attacking these same targets inside Russia. Ukraine needs better allies. We're going to pop into this idea in in the next sec section as to whether the US really is forbidding Ukraine to do to attack those targets inside Russia. There is the there is the idea that's that's pretty much understood that you can't use Western weapons that have been provided to Ukraine to do that. But the idea that they've been forbidden to do so is, as I mentioned yesterday, arguably incorrect. Energy infrastructure was also hinted. Cassie says Tim White. Tim White was trying to um, document it, but there there is not a huge amount of detail coming out at the moment. Um, but I'm sure it will filter through today. Just, yeah, lots of strikes around Ukraine. It probably quite a problematic night for Ukraine last night. 3D Tech, so that's a private energy company in Ukraine. Thermal power plants were attacked by Russia last night. The strike severely damaged equipment, says no reports. It's also known that a power engineer was wounded. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Energy said that they are already working on trying to eliminate the consequences. They're going to be working super hard all the time at the moment. Um, it's Herculean task to keep Ukraine's energy, uh, energy infrastructure going. Uh, while Russia is consistently trying to hammer it. Romania's defense industry investigates a drone that's crashed near Ukraine's border inside Romania. Uh, so that's now coming out. It's not for the first time. It's at least the, at least the fifth crash since last September, while Mo Moldova reports hearing explosions as well. So very close to, uh, that'll be, if we can find that map again, and that'll be down here in this area. But actually, look, we've got a uh, a dr no, that's a cruise missile. Goodness me. So a cruise missile has taken this circuitous route. That's absolutely incredible, coming all the way down to here and then disappearing there. So that's very close to the border there. But anyway, drones, evidently, this is not showing the paths of any of the drones. 58 of 60 were shot down, uh, but there, there, uh, there are, is evidence of drones falling in Romania. Uh, it's going to be around here. So this is this southern border there is i don't even can see that because my face is in a different place now isn't it let's go and uh move well no that's all right it's still okay anyway let's put them back down there um look i'm flying uh so anyway uh down down here you've got the danube river and some important port infrastructure remy and ishmael ports that that are often targeted so that could well be where the 
uh, drones landed inside uh, foreign territory. Uh, explosions reported near Saki military base in occupied Crimea. So this Ukrainian striking because we actually it's been fairly quiet. And to be honest, I will use the same mantra on Ukraine as I do on Russia. You uh, you would if you could. You aren't, so you can't. I, I presume Ukraine are not hitting Russia because they're either stockpiling because they don't have the numbers or they don't have the numbers full stop of of drones and missiles to continually hit Russia on a nightly basis. So this is one of these quiet points between strikes. Um, and obviously, you know, from a pro-Ukrainian point of view, you'd like them to be able to, to be hitting Saki military base in Crimea every single night and targets within Crimea and the occupied territories. Right, moving to other bits and pieces. As mentioned, Zelensky was interviewed on CBS last night. It's an excellent interview. Go and watch it if you can. Uh, it revealed that the Russian Federation is planning an offensive at the end of May or June. So that's what he claimed. He described Russian artillery attacks on settlements as precursors to potential occupation attempts. Zelensky emphasized the need for increased international assistance as 75% of American aid remains in the United States. He, he actually did a really good job of um, saying how beneficial it is for USA to be given to Ukraine in terms of keeping jobs and tax inside the US is like 75, 80% of that money stays in the US. And he also then went on to say, and all our Patriot batteries are basically not from the US, they're from other nations, um, although the one is supposed to be from, from the US. But nonetheless, he, he, the idea is when those Patriot batteries are bought for Ukraine by other nations and when the ammunition is bought it's the US that of course gets that benefit so I mean you could make a case that yeah 80% of that money stays in in the US and 20% might go directly to Ukraine but then when all this other money from other nations comes to Ukraine in terms of um, munitions and air defense systems so when Germany's providing Patriot air defense systems to Ukraine and the munitions for them and we hear that Japan uh, is is providing Patriot missiles possibly or backfilling? Then that money goes to the US as well. So that twenty percent that's that's is going directly to Ukraine from the US is recouped in sales that go to the US from other nations. And so you could argue, I don't know, but there would be you could make a case that if you look at the whole world in general, a hundred percent of the US money stays in the US. On, by point of fact, they get all these orders in. Anyway, I digress. Um, so, so he was big on saying that. Additionally, he warned of potential missile strikes on other states if Ukraine were to face defeat. Now, due to drone attacks on Russian refineries, gasoline production is in Russia has decreased by 14% year on year and diesel fuel by 7%. I've talked a lot about this recently. This was reported by Radio Liberty, citing data from Federal uh, State Statistics Service. By mid-March, the armed forces were able to disable about a sixth, 16% of Russia's automotive fuel production, the publication writes. Now, there has been all this talk about, and you saw a couple of these analysts uh, talk, like Jen Kiv, I think it was, or, or, or uh, no, someone else, Pekka Kalyanami, saying that, uh, you know, the Ukrainians are forbidden from striking inside uh, in, inside Russia. Actually, Jake Bro has looked at this, so I'm just going to, you know, refer to him for, for a rebuttal to this idea. Now, concerning this language, Washington does not encourage. This is political speak. What you're hearing is what the United States wants the Russians to hear, but it's not what it means. So it's important to go to the actual quote. This is uh, U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller, and this is what he said. Our position since the beginning of this war has always been that we do not encourage or support attacks by Ukraine outside its territory. Now, people in Europe are hearing this and they're upset. This person from Germany states, the United States is simply lost. The U.S. does not support Ukrainian drone attacks on Russian refineries. Here's Gary Kasparov, his reaction to this statement. The United States confirms it doesn't want Ukraine to win. Playing only defense is hopeless. Ukraine must be able to strike the launchers of the weapons killing its innocent civilians every day. 
Why is U.S. policy to limit its allies instead of deterring and defeating its enemies? Once again, go back to the statements. And he stated that the United States does not encourage or support. Not encouraging is not the same as discouraging. On one end, you have encouraging. On the other hand, you have discouraging. And you can be neutral about it. The official position of the United States has always been that Western supplied weapons should only be used in the occupied territories. But Ukraine can do whatever it wants with their domestically produced weapons. That's what Ukraine is doing, building their own uh, kamikaze drone fleet and attacking Russian targets inside of Russia. The United States is never going to encourage Ukraine to do this. But they're also not discouraging them to do it as well. The United States is trying to play it neutral to pacify or appease the Russians. And the reason why... So, and he goes on to explain, you know, there's a very good reason that the US will be very careful about their rhetoric because Russia has a whole bunch of nuclear weapons pointing at the US. They've got this hotline between the US and Russia to try and defuse these scenarios. But essentially, I think he's right. And I initially, when I heard the FT article that was talking about how you, there were these anonymous sources from the US administration saying that they're not happy or they don't want Ukraine to hit Russian oil refineries. And then everyone kicks off about that, and I, myself included. But actually, I think that was probably a bit of politicking, a bit of leaking uh, on purpose in order that they are telling... The, the audience for that wasn't you or I. The audience for that was Russia. And tell them that US aren't, aren't helping the Ukrainians, and we're not officially helping the Ukrainians to blow up Russian stuff inside Russia. That's not what we're doing. We're helping them blow stuff up inside Ukraine that is Russian. But we're not doing that. But they're not they're not forbidding them to do that. And nowhere has the language been that they're forbidding them. And that's how people have interpreted it. And that would itself be incorrect. So I think that's really worth uh, understanding there. Um, as, as I said, I'm going to talk, talk through the uh, the interview with Zelensky on CBS. But in, in the meantime, a bit of homework well worth you uh, going to check that out in full. Uh, moving on to other bits and pieces here, like uh, just uh, this could be anywhere in, in my pieces, but Irish actor and Game of Thrones star Jack Gleason visited Ukraine with a mission to deliver a pickup truck from British volunteers for the needs of the AFU. He was a volunteer in Ukraine. <laughs> this is brilliant. But whenever I look at that, I, just, I have to get over, you know, having, watched, having read and watched all Game of Thrones and whatnot. You know, he, the, the casting choice for this guy was insanely good because you absolutely despise this person in the role he's in as as Joffrey uh, Baratheon uh, in that in that series and uh, he's just like so despicable as a human and then when you see him as like a real person you just can't like get away from the fact that you were horrible you're a horrible human of course he's not he's doing wonderful things for Ukraine but as soon as I, I saw that I'm like uh, obviously you want to get over that and he the poor lad he, he must be typecast uh, you know because because of that role. Anyway, uh, uh, that was just a random aside. So uh, there's also been another really important interview, uh, as well as that Zelensky one, and this is with Sursky. Now, Sursky ain't the most popular guy in Ukraine, uh, taking over from Zeluzhny, people like Zeluzhny. The jury is still out. I don't know enough about what Zeluzhny did and what his shortfalls were and what Sursky is doing and has done and what his shortfalls are to be able to give you any kind of critique of, of him, if it, even if that would be justified. But the interview was pretty far-reaching that he gave with Ukraine form. So just in the February, March of this year, as of March the 26th, the enemy lost more than 570 tanks, 1,430 armoured combat vehicles, almost 1,680 artillery systems, 64 air defence systems. The enemy activity in the air was also reduced thanks to the skill of our air defence units in just 10 days in February. They shot down 13 enemy aircraft, including two strategically important A-50 surveillance and control aircraft. We hope to receive from our partners more air defence systems and most importantly, missiles for them. Uh, so that is kind of turned the party line with the general staff figures. Valery Zaluzhny and I worked side by side during the most difficult time since the beginning of the Russian full-scale invasion and even before we worked as one team. I wish him success in his new and very responsible position. 
Okay, he's, so he's saying all the things I suppose he's supposed to say. I can confirm that the composition of the general staff and other military command and control bodies will be updated with combat officers with extensive practical experience in combat operations, which they acquired on the fields of war. Now, this is interesting. Uh, I know this is just the summary given by uh, Dimitri here, but uh, if this was directly after the paragraph or you know the views he was saying about Zeluzhny to then say this. This is quite important because in order to say that the composition of the general staff and other military command and control bodies will be updated with combat officers, it means they previously didn't have that, which is, I think, a if it's not a criticism of Zeluzhny, it is saying how things were under Zeluzhny. It's just that there were people in positions that didn't have combat experience making making decisions about combat is how I understand that, and it's like that is going to be updated and changed. Uh, so yeah, that I think is a significant little nugget there. Today, the process of rotation of military units on the front lines has already been launched, which allows us to fully restore the combat effectiveness of not only equipment but above all to ensure the rest and recovery of military personnel to ensure the process. We need people. That is why I would like every person of military aid in Ukraine to realize that it depends on his will and actions for Ukraine to survive. So he's appealing to volunteers to come forward, but also saying that we are rotating and giving people enough rest now because that audit that he did as soon as he got in to his position. In fact, they are now saying that they don't need as many as 500,000, which is a number touted previously. They need fewer people because of that rotation and audit that, that's taking place. Ukrainians continue to defend their country in particular when returning from abroad. We have a lot of volunteers and this is not an exaggeration. I'm not saying that there are no problems, but I emphasize that we are doing everything to solve them. Interesting trying to control that narrative there. We are currently reviewing the strength of certain units not participating in combat operations based on the audit of their activities. This allowed us to release thousands of troops and send them to combat units. We withdrew our forces from Avdivka because the enemy had a significant advantage in the forces and means of assault units due to con constant bombardment of guided by guided aerial bombs the integrity of our defenses was compromised which allowed the enemy to gradually advance forward this i completely agree with and what i've been saying for a long time it's those it's yeah boots on the ground of course but actually if you're just gonna have boots on the ground to have them bombed by these aerial bombs you don't want boots on the ground you're just gonna sacrifice them to the to to these bombing raids uh, it is about artillery ammunition and equipment so stuff Ukraine didn't have enough stuff enough ammunition but also they didn't have anything to combat the air advantage that the Russians have got and their ability to throw these carb bombs in, onto the front lines the insufficient amount of ammunition for our artillery also played a negative role so he's, he's admitting that those two components was so important. And that's what I said. Oh, I mean, it's pretty obvious. That's why Abdivka was lost. This did not allow effective counter-battery warfare under such conditions to avoid encirclement and save people's lives. I decided to leave Abdivka. Yep. And you wonder if they'd had all the stuff that they're getting now and if the US had given the $60 billion and if they had a couple of Patriot systems near the front line, whether Abdivka would still be under the control of the Ukrainians. I assume it would. We cannot ignore any information about the enemy's preparation for offensive action, so we are taking all measures to adequately respond to such a possibility. Today we are carrying out a large complex of works on fortification equipment of territories and positions. We already have experience in combat operations in the Kharkiv region. We managed to calculate the enemy and liberate a significant part of the Kharkiv region. At this time a large scale collapse of the Russian front occurred. If the Russians go there again, Kharkiv will be become a fatal city for them. Bit of a warning, keep your hands off Kharkiv there. We are very grateful to our Western allies, NATO countries and the European Union and other partners for their support. Without such support, without the supply of weapons, ammunition, air defence systems and heavy equipment, it would be much more difficult for us to fight an insidious and powerful enemy. The latest case is Adivka. We would, of course, maintain the posi these positions if we had the sufficient number, first of all, of air defence systems and artillery shells, just what I've said. This is not a complaint, but a statement of fact. We can... I mean, it's true, right? And by point of fact, that is um, the reality that they hadn't been supplied that stuff by allies to the required uh, number. We can mention the rearmament of artillery units with the domestic 155mm Bogdan cannon while simultaneously equipping it with an automatic fire guidance system. Soon we can expect that some samples of western howitzers and domestic rifled mortars will be produced in Ukraine. Another good example is a restoration and overhaul of the American-made M777 howitzers. We have established production of some of these parts here in Ukraine. In particular, when restoring each of this howitzer, 
40% of the parts and spare parts manufactured for the needs of the armed forces of Ukraine at domestic enterprises are used. So when they're fixing up an M777, 40% of those spare parts are being built in Ukraine. That's brilliant. Really good. So this, for me, is one of the most you know, revealing and, and best piece of news. They're using Bogdan. They're updating but, but the fire guidance system on the Bogdan. We know that they've got a number of these being built. I showed you the uh, the production line yesterday in that. So anyway, uh, interesting stuff from Suski. So uh, that's enough from, from me today. I will leave you with just a, a bit of spam. It is Good Friday today. So for those Christians out there who, who you know, feel that's important time of year, good stuff. If you're slightly less inclined to believe that, I have a book called The Resurrection of Critical Examination, the, uh, the Easter Story, that has a whole plethora of awesome reviews uh, there. Um, a must read for the average person interested in the resurrection. Uh, excellent in-depth examination of the most important Christian myth. Uh, a nailed it, uh, very resourceful, so on and so forth. So if, if you want to pick, pick up that book and look at some critical analyses of the claims uh, about about this this time of year, uh, this Easter time, it is it is a pretty in depth, fairly um, academic book, but written in a way that the that the average reader, uh, the 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 intelligent layperson will will get a lot out of it. So um, uh, yeah, go for it. That's the resurrection of critical examination. Uh, if you are so inclined, uh, but but if you're crazy religious, probably not the book for you. Um, Anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Take care and speak to you soon.